In this video, we're going to look at FRQ number one from the 2023 AP Bio exam. The topic is signal transduction, and we're going to look at situations where signals get blocked and where signals get amplified. Along the way, we're going to analyze plenty of experimental data. Are you ready for AP Bio Review? Before we get started, I wanted to let you know about our tips for succeeding on the AP Bio FRQs. You can download it at apbiosuccess.com slash FRQs. It's going to really help you succeed. Question one, introduction. By the way, you should download the College Board's version of the 2023 FRQs. My diagrams have been redrawn. You should see the College Board's diagrams in their original form. That's the best way for you to practice learning how to analyze their visual representations. In eukaryotic microorganisms, the faux signaling pathway regulates the expression of certain genes. These genes, faux target genes, encode proteins involved in regulating phosphate homeostasis. When the level of extracellular inorganic phosphate, PI, is high, a transcriptional activator, faux 4 is phosphorylated by a complex of two proteins, FO80 and FO85. As a result, the FO target genes are not expressed. When the level of extracellular PI is low, the activity of the FO80, FO85 complex is inhibited by another protein, FO81, enabling FO4 to induce the expression of these target genes. A simplified model of this pathway is shown in Figure 1. In a high phosphate environment, this complex, FO80, FO85, takes FO4 and phosphorylates it. It takes a phosphate from ATP and plants it onto FO4. And we see DNA over here, but the DNA is not doing anything. In a low phosphate environment, FO81 inhibits the FO80, FO85 complex. That enables FO4 to act as a transcription factor. Here it's interacting with DNA, expressing FO target genes, which become FO target gene mRNAs, which become proteins that are encoded by those FO target genes. Question 1A, part one, describe the effect the addition of a charged phosphate group can have on a protein that would cause the protein to become inactive. Pause the video, write out your answer, hit play when you're ready to see my answer. Here's the answer. Adding a phosphate group would change the structure of the protein, changing its function, and in this case, making it inactive. Here you see that FO4 is becoming phosphorylated by the FO80, FO85 complex, and that is not acting as a transcription factor. You didn't have to justify that, but again, remember, the goal is to get ready for the next FRQ, where you could be asked to justify a question like this. And what you'd have to know is that proteins have a primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. And at the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary levels, the protein shape is stabilized by all kinds of internal bonds, which include ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds, Here's hydrophobic clustering. This is a sulfhydryl group, a disulfide bridge. And the key point is that if you take a charged functional group, like a phosphate group, and attach it to the protein, there can be a ripple effect that goes all throughout the protein, changing its shape. Question 1A, part two, explain how a signal can be amplified during signal transduction in a pathway, such as the faux signaling pathway. Pause the video, write your answer, Hit play when you're ready to see my answer. Here's the answer. Each step in the pathway activates multiple signal molecules, mRNAs, and proteins in the subsequent steps. So we see here, FO4 is reading the target genes. It's transcribing those genes. That's going to make multiple mRNAs. And those mRNAs can each create multiple proteins. The example of amplification that you probably learned about during your biology course is more dramatic and it involves the amplification of an epinephrine signal in a G protein coupled receptor. And the basic idea is that epinephrine stimulates adenyl cyclase to create 
multiple cyclic AMPs. Each of those cyclic AMPs, that's the second messenger, will activate multiple protein kinases, and those protein kinases will be part of a phosphorylation cascade that'll activate many, many glycogen phosphorylases. That's the terminal enzyme. If you want to crush it on this year's AP Bio exam, then you're going to have to write great responses on the FRQ portion of the exam. It's half of your score. Where can you learn how to do that? On learn-biology.com with our enhanced practice FRQs. You read a prompt, you type in your response, we give you feedback telling you about your answer's strengths and weaknesses. If you need help, you can ask for a hint. If you're really stuck, you can study a sample answer. We have dozens of practice FRQs, and this is the kind of practice and feedback that'll lead you to crush it on this year's AP Bio exam. So here's your plan. Go to learn-biology.com, sign up, use our enhanced practice FRQs to get the practice you need to succeed. Question 1b moves us into the analysis of experimental results. Here's the introduction. To study the role of the different proteins in the faux pathway, researchers used a wild type strain of yeast to create a strain with a mutant form of faux 81 FO81MT, and a strain with a mutated form of FO4, FO4MT. In each of these mutant strains, researchers measured the activity of a particular enzyme, APase, which removes phosphates from its substrates and is encoded by FO1, a FO target gene, and that's shown in Table 1 over here. They then determined the level of FO1 mRNA relative to that of the wild type yeast strain, which was set to 10. It's a lot of information. You want to take a moment and look at this table. Question 1b, part 1. Based on table 1, identify a dependent variable in the researcher's experiment. Go ahead, hit pause, answer the question, and then hit play. And what I'll do is I'll first give you some background about experimental design, and then I'll show you the answer. The independent variable is what you are testing. What the experimenters are testing are these mutant strains of FO81 and FO4. The dependent variable, that's the results that you get. So here we see APS activity in a high PI environment, a low PI environment, relative amounts of FO1 in a high PI environment and a low PI environment. Those are your dependent variables? The answer, it could be either one of the following. The dependent variables are either APACE activity, these columns over here, or relative amounts of FO1 mRNA, these over here. And again, remember, you weren't asked this, but the independent variable is the presence or absence of these mutated proteins. Question 1b, part 2, Justify the researchers using the wild type strain for the creation of the mutant strains. Hit pause, write down your answer, hit play to see my answer. Here's the answer. Using the wild type strain over here ensured that the observed differences were due to the introduced mutations and not anything else. And just to say this very simply, the wild type strain is the strain that's found in nature. It's not mutated. So if you want to create mutations, you would start with the wild type strain, you'd mutate it, and then you could see the effect of the mutations. Question 1b, part 3. Justify the researchers using mutant strains in which only a single component of the pathway was mutated in each strain. Hit pause, write your answer, hit play to see my answer. The answer is that by mutating only a single component, they could measure the effect of that specific mutation. This question kind of gets at the essence of the scientific method. You change one thing at a time. That's what a controlled experiment is all about. You change one thing and then you see the effect of that one change. That's what these experimenters did over here by introducing one mutation at a time. Here's the single mutation in FO81. Here's the single mutation in FO4. Question 1c, part 1. Based on the data in Table 1, identify the yeast strain and growth conditions that lead to the highest relative amount of FO1 mRNA. The data is in the table. Hit pause, find it, 
write your answer, hit play when you're ready to see my answer. Here's the answer. They're asking you to find the yeast strain, so one of these three, and the growth conditions that lead to the highest relative amount of FO1 mRNA. And that is over here where the value is 10. So the answer is wild type yeast, wild type yeast in a low inorganic phosphate environment. Question 1C, part two. Calculate the percent change in APACE activity in wild type yeast cells in a high PI environment compared with that of wild type cells in a low PI environment. Hit pause, do your calculation, hit play when you're ready to see mine. You have two options here and the College Board shows you both. So I'll show you one, you can use your scoring guide to see the other. When I think about the percent change in this APACE environment, I'm kind of thinking that you start over here and you end over here. That's important because how do you do percent change? It's your final value minus your initial value divided by your initial value times 100. So it all depends on the order that you plug the numbers in and here's how I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna take 17.3 as my final value. I'm gonna subtract 0.5 as my initial value. 17.3 minus 0.5, that's 16.8, divided by 0.5, that's 33.6. I'm gonna multiply that times 100, and I get 3,360%. But you could do it in the reverse order. The College Board will show you how, and I think then the answer would have been minus 97%. And it's both correct, because they didn't ask you for percent increase or decrease, they just asked you for percent change. Question 1D. In a follow-up experiment, researchers created a strain of yeast with a mutation that resulted in a non-functional FO85 protein. Based on figure one, predict the effects of this mutation on FO1 expression in the mutant strain in a high PI environment, high phosphate environment. Provide reasoning to justify your prediction. So you're gonna study figure one, you're gonna figure out your answer, you're gonna hit play when you're ready to see my answer. Your prediction should be that the faux target genes will be expressed. In other words, we're moving from this situation over here to this situation over here. Why? That's your justification. If FO85 were non-functional, here's FO85, then FO4 would not be phosphorylated. In other words, this phosphorylation over here doesn't happen. That would lead FO4 to act as a transcription factor. See that happening over here, leading to the expression of FO target genes, FO target gene mRNAs, and to proteins that are encoded by those FO target genes. Let's talk about some related topics because of course, it's important to understand past FRQs, but your goal is to prepare for the next FRQs. So this question was about signal transduction, and you should be on top of the differences between steroid hormones shown over here on this side and water soluble or polar hormones. The steroid hormones, they'll diffuse through the lipid bilayer, they'll bind with a cytoplasmic receptor, diffuse into the nucleus, they'll activate genes, whereas the water soluble hormones will bind with receptors and they'll activate a second messenger. This leads us to the topic of G protein coupled receptors, which are fantastic systems where you have a receptor that's built into the membrane. It communicates with a G protein. It's not shown here, but the G protein is normally inactive after the ligand binds. The G protein will bind with GTP. That'll activate adenylyl cyclase. Adenylyl cyclase will activate the second messenger, cyclic AMP, by chopping two phosphates off of an ATP. And that second messenger will move deep into the cytoplasm and initiate a phosphorylation cascade. Those phosphorylation cascades look like this, where you have one protein kinase activating the next, activating the next, in a chain that leads to massive amplification. This is important stuff to know about. We've got great tutorials for this on 
learn-biology.com. To get ready for those next FRQs, I want to encourage you to go over to learn-biology.com. Use our enhanced practice FRQs with AI feedback. You'll type in your answers. You'll get fantastic feedback. That will really help you hone the quality of your responses, setting you up for a four or a five on this year's AP Bio exam. Your next moves for AP Bio success are to go to learn-biology.com and sign up so you can use the incredible resources that we have there for you. Incredible AP Bio reviews, tutorials about every topic, and you want to watch this next video.